Good evening and welcome back to another session of our segment entitled Comfort Versus in Context. Now, the aim of these teaching sessions would be that it would attune your heart to the truth in the midst of the crisis that is affecting our world today. Now, during these times, it is a phenomena that scripture has been tossed around and thrown around as if it is a placebo and it offers false comfort because the true meaning of scripture passages have not been taken for consideration and careful reflection. Now, one of these verses that is used in times like this would be Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Now, let me read this passage to you. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Now, this is what the Word of God says. If my people, who, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, here we see in this passage, the solution as would be shown us by those who use this passage in times like this. Now, they will approach this passage like this. Who are involved? Then they will quote the verse, the words, My people, if my people, which are called by my name. Now that phrase, they will say, would refer to the Christians and the church. So what now? So these are the people involved. Now what should be done? Now the passage would be saying that what should be done should be that they would humble themselves, pray, Seek the face of God and turn away from their wicked ways. Here they will interject the various social advocacies that they, they like to have, which would be like homosexuality or abortion, saying that the calamities that are befalling the world today is because of these particular sins. Now, now they would see what's the outcome. If we will do these things, what would the outcome be? So we read the passage again and it says that if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So you see the three things that God would hear from heaven and God would uh, God would hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and God will heal their land. Now, this is a picture of what's happening and this is very timely in the world that is shaken by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as a result, the world is now calling to God in prayer, praying and saying, Lord, heal our land. Now, as a matter of fact, one pop artist or one Filipino pop artist uh, made a song about that. The title of the song is uh, Heal Our Land by Jamie Rivera. Now, the lyrics goes like this. It says, Father, heal our land, hear our cry, and turn our nation back to you. Lord, heal our land, hear us, Lord, and heal our land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Lord, we bow our knee, we humble ourselves, humble ourselves and pray. Lord, we seek your face and humble ourselves and turn from my wicked ways. Father, in your mercy, forgive our sins. Father, in your mercy, come heal our land. Lord, heal our land. Such is the prayer of some, if not many, churches today in the light of this global pandemic. Now, it is a good prayer, especially in the light of verse 13. Because if verse 14 gives us the solution, verse 13 gives us the problem. Let me turn your attention again to that. In verse 13, the Word of God says this, If 
I shut up heaven and that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. So here we see the problem. The problem should be, number one, no rain or drought. Now, uh, this is especially true in Puerto Princesa, Palawan, or in Palawan as a region, since it has been a few, uh, since uh, it was February when it last rained. Also, locusts devouring the land is very uh, timely because as of April 14, 2020, there is a huge locust swarm that affects uh, East Africa, parts of Asia, and the Middle East. So, things are parang falling into place. Pestilence, the third one, is very timely in the light of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Now, as of the moment, as of this time, it is recorded that there are 2,261,425 coronavirus cases as of this time. And the deaths are at 154,734. It's a pandemic of global proportions. The Philippines in itself, as of April 18, 2020, we already have 6,087 cases with, uh, with, 300, uh, with 300 plus deaths since April 18 at 4 p.m. This actually makes the verse very timely. Now you see, we have a problem, verse 13. Now we have a solution, verse 14. So the question is, why not do it? Why not do the solution? Why not we say, let us pray to God to heal our land? Why not we say to God, Lord, forgive our sins, we turn to you, etc., etc., as verse 14 says. Why not do it? Now this, my friends, is what is called pragmatism. Now let me define pragmatism to you. Pragmatism is defined as an approach that assesses the truth of meaning of theories and beliefs in terms of success of their practical application. So what's wrong with approaching scripture in this way, we may think? Well, the truth is, just like spiritualizing and devotionalizing a passage, what pragmatism does is it disregards the true meaning of the passage and makes it say things that in the end, it would be taken against God. Now, because of this mentality, many agnostics and atheists have mocked Christians for their dramatic and sensationalized prayer for the Lord to stop the virus. You, you may be aware that in Facebook, Many posts go about saying, we command the virus in Jesus' name to stop. But it keeps on going. Some people would pray, Lord, uh, you bind this virus. But it still keeps going. So every time that happens, the atheists and agnostics mock the Christians. Ironically, they become like Prophet Elijah in the story in the Bible. Wherein Prophet Elijah is chiding the prophets of Baal for Baal to act. The same thing is happening to the agnostics. They are chiding the Christians who are praying, who are crying, who are seeking God and saying, Oh, where's your Christians, God? Where, where, where are your, where's your God, Christian? Saan siya? Baka natutulog, baka nagpapahinga, baka naman naglalakbay, or otherwise preoccupied. God is not hearing you. And they will mock the Christians and say, Okay, tanyo na. The Christians are praying, but it will be science that solves the problem. And when science solves the problem, they will give God the credit and they will mock us. They will mock us terribly because of our misapplication of this passage. They mock the Christians saying, uh, they mock the Christians because as the pandemic rages on, the solution to the problem appears not to be working. Ultimately, as the pandemic rages on, they will see Christians stumble in prayer and conclude as many Christians at the end of this pandemic, at this time, that God is unfaithful to His promises. 
Now, that's the problem. That's a very big problem. Because, because pragmatism makes the passage, this passage, say something that it doesn't say. You see? That is how devastating pragmatism is to the scripture. So tonight, my aim is to expound what this passage is really saying. Now, to understand the meaning of a passage, we have to identify, identify three essential elements. Number one, who is talking? That would be the author or the speaker at a given time. Number two, it would be who is being talked to. Sino ang kausap? This would be the recipient or the one who is being talked to in our passage. This is actually very important. But the third important essential element would be the dispensational placement. Meaning, this is the time or era in which the conversation is taking place. Now, maybe you're saying, why is this important? Now, let me illustrate it in two ways. Number one, uh, it goes with how meanings change as eras come by. It's akin to that. Not exactly the same, but it's, it has some similarities. Like, for example, for the boomer generation and the millennial generation, uh, the real millennial generation, the word bash, okay, you hear that? The word bash is actually a hip way of saying party, okay? Party. However, for Gen Zers of this generation in the social media mindset, the word bash simply means to attack or criticize. You see how it's different? When two eras pass, meanings of words did change. Diba? Another one, another example would be just like buying canned tuna in the supermarket during this time of the COVID crisis. Now, I realize that there are regulations that says na dalawang at two or three of a kind lang ng tuna ang pwede mong bilhin at a time. So, we go to the supermarket. If you buy more than three, they stop you and say you can only buy three. Before the quarantine days, you can buy as much as you want. You see? So before the quarantine, no limit. After the quarantine, there's a limit. And you can never say, Ay, bakit dati ganito? Well, that's a different era. The same is true with dispensational placement. Now, the idea is we have to understand the factors in play when this promise was given. Now, this is how you rightly divide the word of truth. Now, for, for more information about rightly dividing the word of truth, you may want to send me a private message or write in the comments and I will send you some files and teaching material, uh, teaching files, so that you can better understand how to rightly divide the word of God. Now, let me just issue a warning that we cannot oversimplify the interpretation process and simply say, just determine the author's intended meaning. That is so cliche, and that is actually a, an oversimplification and a presumption. Without determining these three elements, you may be lost. You cannot presume what the author's intended meaning is. So, we have to take a look at our passage and determine who is talking, who is he talking to, and the dispensational placement of our passage. So, let's apply that tree to our passage today. Number one, who is talking? So, sino nagsasalita? To determine that, we'll just move one verse up. In verse 12, let me read it to you. It says this, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. So, very clear. Who is talking? The Lord. And I want you to notice that in your Bibles, the word Lord is capital L 
O R D. So what does it mean? Uh, in the preface preface of your Bibles, it would actually uh, just simply explain to you that when the words Lord is capital L O R D, it speaks about the covenant name of God, which is Jehovah. So take note of that word, covenant name, Jehovah. The key word is covenant. Okay, number two, who is being talked to? Now, verse 12 also reveals the same thing. The verse 12 shows us that God is talking to Solomon. Now, who is this Solomon? We have to be very clear. Uh, maybe you're presuming, sino ba tong Solomon na to? Uh, that Solomon, my friends, is the son of King David, his successor, actually. And he is, at this time, the king of Israel. Now, that's very important. Solomon is the king of Israel, and as king of Israel, he represents the whole nation of Israel. Now, maybe you say, Pastor, saan mo nakuha yung assumption na yan? Well, when he prayed to God, and in verse 12, sinabi dyan ng Panginoon, I have heard your prayer. God, talking to Solomon, God has heard Solomon's prayer. When Solomon prayed to God for the nation of Israel, in the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon represents the nation of Israel as its theocratic head. You get that? Now, the idea is God is talking to Solomon and Solomon had prayed to God a prayer that God is answering in verses 12 to 14 of this specific passage. So the question is, what is happening here? So here we come to the dispensational placement. What is the Lord and Solomon talking about? Now, by now, we begin to understand that verses 12 to 14 of Second Chronicles 7 is actually God's conversation with Solomon and is God's promise dealing with Israel. This makes it clear that yung phrase jan my people which are called by my name is not the church nor the Christians. Do not assume that this is the body of Christ as expressed in the Pauline epistles because it is clear this is Jehovah God the covenant name of God upholding the covenants of Israel to Israel now, I want us to prove that uh, that presupposition okay now I have to uh, we have to understand what did Solomon pray about that the Lord said in verse 12 to 14 that he is answering. Now, this prayer is contained in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 14 to 22. Uh, verse 14 to 42. So, just turn one chapter behind. And essentially, this prayer of Solomon contains the following key points. Let's just look at it, okay? Number one, it, in verse 16, it contains Solomon calling God the God who keeps the covenants and invokes the Davidic covenant. And let us read it so that we can really understand what's going on. So verses 14 to 16, we would read this. And said, this is Solomon talking, praying, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepeth covenant and shewest mercy unto thy servants, that walk before thee with all their heart. Thou which hath kept thy servant David, my father, which thou hast promised him, and spakest with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is today. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in thy sight, to sit upon the throne of Israel, yet so that thy children take heed to their way to walk in my law as thou hast walked before me. So in this particular passage, Solomon is praying that God would invoke the covenant, that God would fulfill the covenant 
he made to David that there will always be a king in the line of David that sits on the throne of Israel. The ultimate fulfillment of this passage would be the millennial kingdom. Now, this, uh, the, uh, this will actually be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. That is one covenant where the Lord promised David and Israel. Also, we would see in verses 24 to 35 that we would see the prayer of Solomon reflecting the covenant blessings given to Israel by God through Moses. I want us to compare this, okay? Because the prayers of the covenant are not actually disjuncted and separated. Let's look at that. In verse 24 to 25, we would read that Solomon prays for a return to the exile by their enemies. Now look at Solomon's prayer in verse 24 to 25. The word of God says this, And if thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from heavens, from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers. S Solomon prayed that Israel will be brought back from exile. Look at how Moses declared it in Deuteronomy chapter in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 2 and 3. Okay, this is what the Word of God says. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 2 to 3. Moses declares, And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I commanded thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. So you see, Solomon prays that the people of Israel will return to, from exile. Moses declared that as a covenant blessing. Now we would see also in verse 26 to 27 of Second Chronicles that, Moses, that Solomon prays for rain in due time. Notice, rain, okay, rain. Ito ang sabi niya in verse 26 to 27 is this. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon thy land which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance now the same covenant blessing is seen in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 12. Don't take my word for it. Check it for yourself. This is the same covenant blessing that Elijah actually invoked. Remember Elijah? When Elijah prayed that there would be no rain, there was no rain for three and a half years. But when he challenged the, the prophets of Baal, to a contest who is the real God with Israel being uh, said do not waver between two opinions and when Israel cried out the Lord he is God Elijah prayed again and there was rain this is the covenant blessing this is what Solomon prayed for not only that but we would also see in verse 34 to 35 of 2 Chronicles 6 verse 34 to 35 Solomon prays for victory over their enemies Verse 34 to 35 says this, If thy people go out to war against their enemies by the way, that thou shalt send them and they pray unto thee toward this city, which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou from heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28 verse 7, the Lord promised that if Israel keeps the law, the covenants, their enemies will scatter before them in seven ways. Not only that, but in verse 28 to 31, Solomon prays for healing of disease. Now look, let's look at that passage, verse 28 to 31. The word of God says this, 
If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, that's a good word, if there be blasting or mildew or locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in, thy, in this house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways, so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto thy fathers. This is Solomon's prayer. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 59 to 61, the same prayer for healing of diseases and a curse for, of diseases upon the disobedience of the children of Israel. The picture is, Solomon prayed, Moses had already declared. Now, all of this actually boils up that essentially, when God said to Solomon the very words of 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12 to 14, God is saying yes to Solomon's prayer on the basis of his covenant with God. Israel. Now, if this is the real meaning of this passage, no man can coerce God or any man for that matter to be faithful to promises he did not make. Is that not clear? <laughs> it's as simple as that. This passage does not apply to us, not even as a long shot. Now, the root issue of this problem is actually hope for the Christians. Now, maybe some of you are watching right now and saying, hindi ba pwedeng apply sa atin yan? as people of God? Hindi ba tayo nag-replace ng Israel? If we replaced Israel, then when did we last offer sacrifices? A bet. When was the last time we went to a priest and the priest has to suffer offerings for us? If that is the case, we should really be judged if we replaced Israel. And also, if we are replacing Israel, then we are not saved by grace. Then we say, let's tear out all the parts of Pauline epistles in our Bibles because the scripture says, the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles says to us that for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we Gentiles would replace Israel, we would have a bigger problem. So if this verse applies to us, actually, uh, we have a bigger problem. But the thing is, the good thing is, it doesn't apply to us. So the issue here is hope. Hope of the Christians in this time of crisis. We want to know what to do and what we can do to alleviate our situation or have a solution to our problem. Now, I believe that is where our trouble lies. We have to understand that our hope as believers in this dispensation of grace has never meant to be what we can do. Have you remembered? Do you remember that our salvation is by grace? Diba? So if our salvation is by grace alone through faith in Christ alone, based on the finished work of Jesus, then the solution to our problem is not supposed to be what we can do. Piniba? Our hope is not meant to be in ourselves, not in the things that we can do, but in three things. Number one, in God who raises the dead. Our welfare has never been to be in this world. Piniba? Because the reason, actually, why we want the solution to our problem now is because we want this and now and we don't think that there's another place for us. No. Our hope is in God who raises the dead. Number two, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ whose finished work on the cross 
His death for our sins, His burial, and His resurrection is sufficient for eternal salvation. And that salvation gives us hope beyond this world. The Apostle Paul writes in his, uh, in his epistles, he wrote saying that if in Christ we, hope, we have hope only in this world, we are of all men most miserable. That's why Jesus Christ gave us salvation that has hope beyond this world. Not only in this world, but beyond this world. Our hope is in the Holy Spirit who sealed us the moment we believe on the Lord Jesus unto the day of the promised redemption. That gives us an idea that the Holy Spirit seals us. He gives us power in the present to do what is right. He gives us past forgiveness of penalty of sin, but He also gives us hope for the future where we will be we, that we will be free from the condemnation and the consequences of sin in this world. Ultimately, my friends, our hope and welfare is not in this world alone. So until then, we hope in God. So friends, thank you for listening to our segment for our section of Comfort Verses in Context. For questions, comments, or suggestions for topics, you can send me a private message or you can write it in the comment box below. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.